My name's Jason Smith. I'm our campus pastor here. I'm filling in for Jesse this morning. And uh, I wanted to make sure y'all knew that because Jesse was just here a couple of weeks ago. And I didn't want you thinking, man, that guy's lost a lot of hair in the past two weeks. But uh, it's good to see you all here this morning. And if you would turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. We're going to begin a study this week of the book of Daniel. A sermon series entitled, Committed or Compromised. And as we stand at the beginning of January January 2013, it's important that we ask ourselves the question, are we committed or are we compromised? The Bible tells us that we are to be introspective in our thoughts, that we are to look within ourselves and examine ourselves. David in Psalms 139, 24 said, Search me, O Lord, know my heart, test me. And know my anxious thoughts, and reveal if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the paths everlasting. And that's a good prayer for us at the beginning of this new year, that we be led in the paths everlasting. But then when we look inside of ourselves, the measuring stick, the standard by which we measure ourselves is found in Hebrews 4.12. When it says that the word of God is living and active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It is sharp enough to divide soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It what? Judges the thoughts and the intentions of a person's heart. And that's really the standard by which we measure ourselves when we look within ourselves and assess where we are spiritually. But the Bible also tells us that we are to be circumspect. Not only introspect, looking within ourselves, but circumspect and understanding ourselves in the context of the world around us. James 5.8 tells us that we are to be patient and firm for the coming of the Lord is soon. Matthew 24.44, Jesus tells us that you must always be ready for the Son of Man will return at an hour which you do not know, which you do not expect. And, of course, Paul tells us in Ephesians 5.16, make the most of every opportunity. What he literally says is that we're to buy back the time. We're to redeem the time because the days are evil. And so as we stand at the beginning of this year and we start looking at the book of Daniel, we need to ask ourselves, are we committed or are we compromised as as a people, as a nation, as a church, as individuals? Let's look at Daniel 1 starting with verse 1 through 5. In the third year, the reign of King Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Judah was the people of God. That's where the Jews lived, and they were God's people. In the third year, the reign of King Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, which was the capital of Judah, and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hands of King Nebuchadnezzar, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. And these Nebuchadnezzar carried off to the temple of his pagan god in Babylonia and put it in the treasure house of his pagan god. And then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his courts, also says chief of the eunuchs, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He wanted the cream of the crop, the best of the best. And then he was to teach them the language and the literature of the evil Babylonians. And the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. And they were to be trained for three years. And after that, they were to enter the evil king's service. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, I thank you for this morning. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would anoint us as we study your word. I pray that the thoughts of our hearts and minds would be pleasing to you. And God, I pray that we would walk away from here hearing what it is that you would have us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Daniel was a young man at this point. You've got to understand, Dan- Daniel was probably about 14 years old when this happened. In the nation that he loved and the family that he was so close to, he was ripped from them at that young age of approximately 14 years old. And we know that he was... 
he was ordered to go as a captive and as a slave to the land of the Babylonians and an evil empire at that time. And you can only imagine what this 14-year-old kid must have thought. And here he is in chains and he's traveling several weeks across the desert to this foreign land of Babylonia as a captive, as a eunuch, knowing that he's going to have to serve this evil king that just conquered his nation, that just conquered his country. Some scholars even believe it's probable that Daniel's parents were slaughtered because certainly no parent would stand by as their child is being carried off into slavery. And so Daniel finds himself in a hostile land as a stranger in a strange land and he's faced with a question. Is he going to be committed or is he going to be compromised? And really for us to understand what's going on, we got to look at the Babylonian Empire and what that really was. And of course, Babylon is a, was the capital city of the Babylonian Empire. It was founded on the banks of the Euphrates River a beautiful, fertile, lush area, and it's in what is today modern-day Iraq. And here's this beautiful empire, this beautiful city, Babylon, and they were known for the seven. They were known as having one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, and what those were is really a pyramid-type shape where terraces were built and these enormous gardens were planted hundreds of feet into the air and it's estimated by archaeologists that some of the trees that were planted in these terraces were, were actually two or three feet in diameter, just huge trees. And when a person looked at these hanging gardens, that it, it gave the appearance of a man-made forested mountain. It was just an amazing structure. The walls of Babylon were 60 feet in circumference, about 300 feet high. They went down 40 feet into the ground. They were so massive, 80 feet wide. They would have chariot races around the top of the walls of Babylon. And this is what Daniel walked into. And no doubt it was intimidating to him. It was frightening to him. And he had to ask himself the question, am I going to be committed or am I going to be compromised? In Babylon, throughout its history, has always been a city and and an empire that is associated with compromise and sin. We look at where Babylon began, and, and you may not know this, and I found it interesting that Babylon started as the city of Babel. Do you remember the city of Babel? In Genesis 11, 4, the people got all together and they said, Come, let us get together and build for ourselves a city and build for ourselves a tower that stretches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Very early on, the foundations of that city was laid as a city that sought to exclude God, that sought to, to, to pursue their own desires and their own agendas. And they thought that absent from God, we can build for ourselves a structure to make it to Godhood on our own. And of course, we know in Genesis 11 that God confused the languages there in Babel and he caused the people to have different languages because he knew that if he didn't, they would continue to build and they would continue to reject him. But that was the foundations of this evil empire, Babel. But really, the word Babel means gateway to God, little g. And it connotes our attempts to try to make godhood on our own, our attempts to be our own lords, to be masters of our own universe. And really, that's the sin that goes all the way back to the very beginning of sin. Isaiah 14, 14 tells us about Lucifer, the devil, the morning star. He said, I will ascend to the mount of the assembly. I will make my place on high. I will ascend above the clouds and I will what? Be like God. And that was Lucifer's sin. He started out as a beautiful angel that was the choir director of heaven, but he sinned when he said, I want to be like God. And we see that sin carrying through to the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden, of course, when he came, when Lucifer, the devil, came to tempt Eve, he came in the form of a serpent. And what did he tell Eve there in Genesis 3? He said, God doesn't want you to eat of this fruit. Because you see, if you eat of this fruit, your eyes are going to be open and you're going to be what? Like God. 
You get to call your own shots. You get to decide what's right and wrong for yourself. You see, that's why God doesn't want you to eat this tree. And what did she do? She chose to be compromised. And she ate of the tree. And then Adam, seeing that she did so, he also chose to be compromised. And he ate of the tree and sin entered the world. And when I look at that that foundation of Babylon, and when I look at what Babel was really founded as, I think about where we are as a culture here today. Moral relativism is a concept that's taken root in our culture where, hey, listen, you can decide for yourself what's right and wrong. You do what feels good to you. As long as you're sincere, it's all good. If, as long as you're a good moral person by your standards, then it's all right. And then it moves into a concept called syncretism that we see in our culture today, where as long as you're sincere and you have faith in something, then all paths lead to God. How many of you heard that on TV? Or don't we all really, at the heart, believe the same thing? And those are concepts that started many, many years ago. And I'll say to our young people who are going to go to college and sit under the liberal college professors, you're going to hear those kind of philosophies. And I'm here to tell you, it's not a new philosophy. It's not an evolved philosophy. It's not an enlightened philosophy. It's the same old lie in the same old package from the same old devil, and it leads to destruction. And it started right there. In the beginning there and with Babel, and this is the kind of empire that Daniel was up against. This is where Daniel found himself. But the, the land of Babylon and the city of Babylon remained a, a pivotal place and location throughout history. And it became synonymous with sin. And we see that each and every time the people of God got into bed with Babylon, bad things happened. And as I was studying for this message, I, I was just shaken to the core as, as I, trembling hands flipping the pages. And I began to see the world that we live in here today. And please hang with me. We've got, some, we've got some facts to cover. And I want you to hang with me because it comes together at the end with a practical application for us here today. But as we look at every time Judah got into bed with Babylon, bad things happened. And that's because, you see, Babylon worshipped a god called Marduk. And Marduk was this evil spirit that, that had it out, that had a fight with a serpent and took the serpent's power. And I submit to you that that god Marduk, who later became known as Baal, the chief of the evil spirits, I submit to you that it was nothing more than Satan worship, that the two were one and the same. And so Babylon was really a place that worshipped Satan, and they had temples built to honor Satan, and that's the world that Daniel found himself in. But it was a world that Judah and the people of God had been flirting with for a long time. You see, we go all the way back to King Hezekiah that was many, many years and generations before Daniel. And we go back to the time of Hezekiah and there's there's some steps that lead to compromise. And you might want to jot these in your notes. And that first step is the step of invitation. Invitation. King Hezekiah was a good king. He honored God. He loved God. But in Isaiah chapter 39, we see that he made an invitation to the people of Babylon to come and check out all my wealth. Let me give you a tour of my palace. And the prophet Elijah said, what are you doing? He said, because you have done this, this wealth that you've shown off to the Babylonians through your invitation, this wealth will one day be in the house of the Babylonians. Invitation is the first step to compromise. The next step is normalization. King Manasseh came after Hezekiah and he did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord and he normalized Baal worship. He normalized this pagan religion by building idols in the temple of God and setting up temples all around to honor Baal. And he said, you know what? You can worship God and you can worship Baal at the same time. It's okay as long as you're sincere about what you believe. And so he normalized Baal worship. And that was actually the longest cultural slide in Israel's, uh, Judah's history there. It was 55 years, the years of normalization of evil. 
And then there was a brief revival. King Josiah came. He was a good king. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And he got rid of a lot of the normalization that had taken place under King Manasseh. But towards the end of Josiah's reign, he began to slip back. And we see the next step, condonation. He began to condone what the Babylonians did because he formed some sort of alliance with them and wouldn't let other kings attack Babylon. And as a result, God removed Josiah and he was struck down in a battle in the valley of Megiddo, which ironically is the valley of Armageddon. And so the next step there was condemnation. But then the next step is where we find ourselves this morning, Daniel chapter 1, the, it's the step of subordination, where basically at this point Babylon has come in, they've, they've sacked Judah, they've conquered Jerusalem, and now Jerusalem is subordinate to this evil empire Babylon. It's very interesting to note that also during this time period, there was a time period of extreme taxation where the wealth of the people of Judah was taken from them and placed in the hands of evil foreign empires. Mm. And the final step that, that leads the path of compromise is desolation. Desolation. King Zedekiah was an evil king and he was actually put in place by, by the king of Babylon as a puppet king and, and he was there but he decided one day I, I want it for myself and he, he was evil and he sought to shake off the chains of Babylon on his own power without calling out to God and it was then that the evil empire of Babylon came in and wiped Judah out. The temple was completely destroyed. The city was raised and sacked. And was, when we look at Babylon and we see its influence corporately and individually, it causes me some great concern because, you see, Babylon was this great military power, cultural power, and a, a spiritual power. And, and the, the, the religion of Babylon, the Baal worship, spread throughout the entire Middle East, even to the point that in the land of Israel and in the land of of Judah, that they were worshiping Baals. And, and, and we see this, this evil empire stretching out. But I look at America today, and I wonder if we are on those steps to compromise, those steps to desolation. I, I'm, I'm your pastor, and I love you, and I, and I hate to be negative, and I'm not trying to, to slam on anyone, but I've got to be honest with you. As a country, we have espoused ourselves with an evil empire, we have taken on a new form of Baal worship, a new form of Satanism in a different package that looks prettier perhaps. And it is that unholy alliance that is going to bring America to its desolation if we don't repent. In, in our halls of government, we've invited it in. In, in our society... We have come to a point that we've normalized it. In our culture, we have condoned it. And we are on the slide to destruction because as we begin to condone it and normalize it, we're going to become, and we already are, I submit, subordinate to it in our economy and in, in our finances. And the next step is desolation. And that, that new form of bell worship may take its form perhaps in greed and it may take its form perhaps in this moral relativism, this syncretism, but I'll tell you there's another form of Baal worship that I'm especially concerned about, that I've seen it invited into the halls of our government and condoned in, in our government and in our elected officials and, and it's really the Baal worship of Islam. You may say to me, Jason, what are you talking about? There's a movement even amongst evangelicals to embrace Islam and to say, you know, it's, they're not all bad. It's okay. We can even form an idea called Chrislam where we can reach out and love one another. And yes, I do believe we need to love the Muslims, but I'll tell you that Islam is another form of Baal worship. And you may say, Jason, but what are you talking about? Allah of the Quran is supposed to be the God of Abraham. Well, I'll tell you this, he's not the God of the Bible. Because the God of the Bible 
teaches us to love our enemies. But Allah and, and what we see in the Quran, it's, it's all about what 1 Peter 3, 5 talks about, that your enemy, the devil, is like a roaring lion roaming this earth to and fro, seeking whom he may devour, resist him standing firm in the faith. And that's what Islam has become, like a roaring lion roaming this earth to and fro, gobbling up and devouring countries and peoples and nations. And then, and then we also see Jesus said in John 10 that your enemy, the devil, he has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And is that not what we see from Islam? And that is, that is exactly what our nation is flirting with. That's exactly what our elected officials are inviting and condoning. And we have become subordinate to it. And the next step will be desolation. And I hate to, I hate to be the bearer of that prophetic news, but it's the truth. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. There are some moral people that practice Islam. There are some, there are some peace-loving people that practice Islam. But at its heart, it's an evil religion. It is Baal worship. And it's my prayer that every Muslim come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It is my prayer that every Muslim understand that while the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy, the God they worship is a God of violence. My God said in John 10, 10, I'm come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And while Islam may espouse a God of war and violence, my God has come to give me the peace that passes understanding. And he tells me that I am to love my neighbor and to do good to those who harm me. And that's the God of the Bible. But we're flirting, as Judah did, with sin, whether it be in the form of Islam or whether it be in the form of just simple greed, moral relativism, syncretism, going any way other than God. We've been flirting with it, and I fear for our destruction. But Babylon is also symbolic of sin and compromise in an individual's life. Revelation chapter 17, we see Babylon, the vision that John had of Babylon, seven. Revelation 17, 3, Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert, and there I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She was pretty. She wasn't some ugly witch. She was attractive. You would look at her and say, Wow, that's a knockout. But let's look at what she did. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. And this title was written on her forehead. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and the abominations of the earth. And I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. And you see, when we espouse ourselves with compromise, when we fall into compromise, when we fall into perversion, when we fall into abomination and sin, it leads to destruction. And it's, it's pretty, folks, I'll tell you. Sin is fun for a little while. Sin is enjoyable for a little while. If it wasn't, people wouldn't do it. But it's enjoyable. But it leads to desolation. Compromise leads to to destruction and you will be conquered at some point engaging in compromise but it's interesting the imagery that's used here for Babylon is the imagery of prostitution of ab- of abominations of adultery and what really is that prostitution and adultery is when you forsake a true love the true love to which God has called you and you substitute for that true love a false love A false love that may seem fulfilling at the moment but is not and will lead to destruction. And God says, don't get in bed with Babylon. Resist him standing firm in the faith. But Daniel was faced with this decision to be compromised or or to be committed. And there's some steps to being committed. Number one there in your notes, remember your forgotten faith. That's how they got into trouble in the first place. They forgot their faith. Judah had turned their backs on God and they had began to espouse themselves with Babylon and they were flirting a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more with sin and they before long forgot their faith. 
And if you are a person that is not in God's word consistently, then maybe you've forgotten your faith. If you're a person that isn't in prayer on a daily basis, then you need to ask yourself this morning, have I forgotten my faith? Am I committed or compromised? If you're a person that it's your instinctive response is to look for your own agenda rather than placing others before yourselves, as it says in Philippians 2, then maybe you've forgotten your faith. If you're that, that person that you, you instinctively, the words that pour out of your mouth are words that don't bring honor and glory to God, the Bible tells us that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Maybe you've forgotten your faith. Remember your forgotten faith. And the enemy wants you to forget it. And he'll do things that will hopefully lead you to a point of forgetting it. And the first thing that he'll do is he'll, he'll lead you to a new place. You'll find yourself in unfamiliar territory, unfamiliar surroundings, a point where you are susceptible to temptation, just as Daniel was taken to the land of Babylon. He'll remove your place. Then he'll try to remove your purpose. Some scholars believe that Daniel was made to be a eunuch. We certainly know that his intent and purpose was to serve in the house of the evil king. And so his purpose was undercut. His purpose was seemingly taken away. And the enemy will put you in a point where you feel like, I have no more purpose. I can't serve God where I am. I can't do what God has called me to do where I am. I can't. I, I'm, I'm powerless. I'm purposeless. Remember your forgotten faith then. And then he'll also try to change your person. As we look in Daniel, the, the, one of the first things that they did when they took these, these young children as captives is, is they changed their names. They tried to change their person. They changed their names from names that brought honor to God Jehovah. And they changed their names to evil names that brought honor to the pagan gods of Babylon. That would be almost like taking children captive from America and giving them the names of the 9-11 hijackers. That's how disheartening it was for these children and how much weight and pressure was on them. But what did they do? When they were faced with the question to be committed or compromised, they chose to be committed. And what was the next step? They decided that they were going to forsake the world standards for their convictions, and they were going to adhere to God's standards for convictions. The next point there in your notes, forsake the world's standards for your convictions. Look at verse 8 of Daniel 1. But Daniel resolved, he committed, not to defile himself, to become compromised. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. He asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. I want you to look at that very closely. When you stand for God, God's favor is on you. You don't have to ask the question, has God gone before me? He is before you. He is behind you. He is around you. He is in you. The Bible tells us and Paul exclaims in Colossians that it is in him that we live and move and have our very being. You are favored by God when you are walking in his paths. But the official had already heard from the Lord. God was already working. He didn't even realize it. And he had favor and sympathy for Daniel. He said, I'm afraid the Lord, the king who has assigned your food and drink, why should, why should he see you looking worse than the other men of your age, Daniel? The king would then have my head because of you. But God was working in that official's heart. And Daniel said to that, that official, he said, listen, please, verse 12, test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink and then compare our appearance with that of the other young men who eat this royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see after that. And so the official agreed and tested them for 10 days. It would have been so easy for Daniel to say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to do... I'm going to do what it is that's the easy thing to do. I can serve Baal and God at the same time. It's all right. 
Look at the environment that I'm in. Because you see, they were, they were the best of the best, the cream of the crop. And here they are, the Babylonians said, I tell you what, you've got an all expenses paid, full ride scholarship to the University of Babylon. And man, you are already a member of the fraternity. All you have to do is eat and drink and have yourself a ball for three years. And then you get to live in the palace for the rest of your life. You are on the fast track, man. But what did Daniel say? No, no, I'm going to be committed. I'm going to be committed. We've lost this sense of obedience in our world today. Real quickly, <laughs> something that I observed. Going to the Publix can sometimes be a real interesting sociological experience. I, enjoy, <laughs> I was waiting in line at the Publix. And I've changed the name to Protect the Innocent. But uh, waiting in line there at the, at the Publix. Johnny, put that candy bar down. Johnny, I said to put it down. And immediately, I, I want to observe this because this is very unusual to me. I didn't grow up in this world, and this was not my reality. I didn't touch the candy bar for fear of great bodily harm. And my parents are here right now, and I'll tell you, I, I, I really feel like I'm a well-adjusted, well-rounded individual. I'm not emotionally scarred by it, but I knew you best better not touch that candy bar unless mom and daddy gave it to you. But anyway, I wanted to see what went down. And so Johnny put that candy bar down, and, and he didn't put it down, and so... Five, four, three, and I'm looking around. We're having a space shuttle launch. What is, I thought they discontinued that program. But did Johnny put it down at three? No. Did he put it down at two? No. Put it down at one? To Johnny's credit, he put it down after one and then picked it back up again, knowing the count would start over. <laughs> now, we can debate how it happened, but we've really lost a sense of obedience in our culture today. An obedience that says, if you love Jesus, you're going to keep his commandments, as God said. You're going to keep his commandments, not because there's a rigid set of do's and don'ts, but you're going to keep his commandments because you love him and you want to keep his commandments. You want to please him. And we've lost that sense of obedience in our world today, and we've, we've began doing what feels right. We've got to get to a point where we forsake the world standards for our convictions. We get back to the Word of God and we say, this is the standard for our convictions and we are going to obey Him. Last point there in your notes, stand out. They stood out, they were different. Look at verse 15. At the end of the ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their... The other, the other boys' choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead, party pooper. And to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. And the evil king talked with them, but he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, the four Hebrew children. So they entered into the king's service. They stood out. They were different. And a couple of principles real quickly to take from this. Live for Jesus where you are. And that's statement enough. They weren't trying to be weird. They weren't trying to be offensive. They were just living for God where they were. You don't have to try to be offensive or try to stand out to stand out in this world living for God. It's going to happen one way or another. You understand what I'm saying? In 1 Thessalonians 4.11 says, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your hands so that you will gain respect from outsiders. You just live for God where you are and it's going to be statement enough. You're going to stand out. When, when there's bad talk going on in your family and there's anger and there's division and there's strife. You live for Jesus and that's going to be statement enough and you be the one with kind words, the gentle word that turns away anger. When you're there at your workplace and everybody's living the way of the world and you don't, you don't have to stand up and hit them over the head with the Bible, you live like Jesus and they're going to say there's something different about this person. 
when you're at school and, and you're, trying to, you're trying to live for Jesus, but it seems so hard and it just seems like the other kids aren't getting it. You, just, you don't have to be offensive. You just stand up for Jesus and say, I'm going to do what God's called me to do because I love him. You can do what you want to, but I can't because I serve a different master. Live for Jesus in that statement enough. Next thing, there's always a remnant. You're never alone. Never alone. Story I heard of a starving actor, and he decided that he needed to make some money, so he went to a zoo, and, and he, he, he began to act like a monkey at the zoo, and they ended up coming to him. The managers of the zoo said, listen, we're, we're, in, a real, we're, we're in a real dilemma right now. We really need you to come, come for us for a minute, and uh, uh, our gorilla died. We need you to play the gorilla. So we've got this gorilla suit. Can you play the gorilla? He said, sure, yeah, I'll do it. So he put on the gorilla suit, and he's dancing around. He's acting like a gorilla, and the people loved him. But after a while, they began to lose interest in him because the lion cage was right next door, and, and the people were looking at the lion because the lion would roar. And so then the gorilla would jump up on the fence. He would shake the fence, and then the lion would come over, and he would roar and get all angry. And the people really loved that drama, so the actor was eating it up. You know, he was having a ball. But he was there on the fence. He was shaking the fence, and the fence fell down, and he's in the lion cage. And he begins to scream, ah, help me, help me. He's running around the lion cage and the lion is chasing him and immediately the lion just pounces on the gorilla, on that starving actor and, and whispers in the gorilla's ear, be quiet, man, or we're both going to lose our jobs. <laughs> so you may feel like you're alone sometimes, but the truth is you are not alone. It may seem like there's no one else around you that's living for God. But I assure you that you are not alone. 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 18. Elijah was talking to God and he felt like he was all alone. He was on the run for his life. Evil Queen Jezebel, a Baal worshiper, was trying to kill him. And he said, God, I'm all alone. And God said, open your eyes, Elijah. There are still 7,000 people in Israel that have not bowed their knee to Baal. You're not alone. Romans chapter 11, verse 5, Paul said, So too at this present time, God has reserved for himself a remnant. And you are not alone. And the last principle to take from this, although it may not feel good, it's for the good. Although it may not feel good, it's for the good. Jeremiah 24, verse 4, really tells us why all this happened and what, what was God's method to the madness. What was God's plan in all this? Then the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah. And this is what the Lord said, the God of Israel said. You see these figs in this basket over here that are good figs? I regard them as good. And they are the exiles from Judah. The, the kids like Daniel. Whom I sent away from this place to the land of the Babylonians. My eyes will watch over them for their, what? Good. And I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I'll point them, I will plant them and not uproot them. I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord. They will be my people. I will be their God for they will return to me with all of their heart. Daniel chapter 1 verse 20. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the qu king questioned them... He found them ten times better than all the mag magicians and enchanters in the whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there throughout the Babylonian empire and even served kings of the next empire. Wow. Are you going to be committed or are you going to be compromised? Are you going to live for God in the pagan land? If you bow your heads and close your eyes... Hi, I'm Jason Smith, the campus pastor for our Lakeside Campus, First Baptist Church, Windermere. If you've been touched by this morning's message, or if you would like to talk to a pastor or have more information about the church, please contact us at our website at www.fbcwindermere.com or please feel free to call us at 407-876-2234. Thank you, and may God bless you.